Well, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you gathered out this morning in the house of God. And we have come together primarily to worship the Lord, to praise his name. And to do so, we're going to sing, first of all, from the Psalm 116, the 116th Psalm, found in page 110 in our, in, in our own hymn book, I Love the Lord, because my voice and prayers he did hear. We're going to sing the first eight verses of this lovely psalm, and after the note we'll stand to sing. Psalm 116, please. Let's sing our best, please. I love the Lord because my voice and prayers he did hear. And while I live, will call on him who by to me his ear. The seek the Lord in prayer, to try and stow our hearts as we bow our heads in his presence. The Lord says, be still, be still and know that I am God. And let's try and capture that moment and that thought as we come to pray. Our Heavenly Father and our gracious eternal God, we bow in your presence this morning. Having already sung your praises, we come in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We recognize him today as our mediator, our advocate in the court of the Father, the one mediator between God and men, the one whose work is all sufficient to reconcile us to God. Or we thank thee that at the very heart of the message that we preach, we have these words, that our Lord Jesus Christ made peace by the blood of his cross. And we thank thee, our Father, that thou hast not only provided salvation for us, but we believe it was also secured when Christ died upon the cross. And in that time, Lord, of your choosing, and in ways that were pleasing to thee, you drew us, our Father, to yourself. We can say this morning he drew me and I followed on, charmed to confess his voice divine. You lifted his Lord from the mire and from the clay. 
and you set our feet upon the rock. And today, Lord, you have put that new song of redemption in our mouth, even praise unto our God. This morning finds us in the kind providence of God in, Lord, your house. We can meet with others of a like precious faith. We have this morning a common salvation of which the writer wrote. And we pray, our Father, that our time might be a profitable time this morning. You've told us, Lord, to redeem the time. We are reminded, Lord, as we look down from the pulpit to the text, even at the back of the church, reminding us that time is short. And, Father, that would remind us to redeem the time. There's no time to spare. There's no time to fritter away. But help us, our Father, to redeem all our, our days, and all our hours and minutes, even in the worship and in the service of the Lord. We thank Thee for the work here in Cumber. We thank Thee, Father, for the many long years that's been here. We remember the work, Lord, when it was starting off. Lord, I just... As we come out, Lord, of the, the prayer meeting this morning in the, in the old building over there, coming toward this beautiful sanctuary, Lord, we could remember preaching, Lord, in what was effectively a wooden hut, the beginnings of the work in this place. And, Lord, you have fulfilled your promise. Although thy beginnings be small, yet, Lord, they would greatly increase. We pray that you might ever maintain the witness here, Thankful that over, Lord, those long years, the word of God has been proclaimed. The gospel has been sounded forth. We're thankful that sinners have been converted. We're glad, Lord, for backsliders that have been restored. And we're glad, Father, for every child of God whose face is thoroughward toward Zion and home, who are pressing on with God. We pray for a little reviving this morning. In the midst of the years, Lord, in the midst of the years, make known. We believe, Lord, revival comes from thee. And we pray, Father, that thou wilt open the windows of heaven this morning and pour us out such a blessing that there will not be room enough even to receive it. Remember all that are in need within the church this morning. We understand that the hand of sickness has struck again. And there are those that have been laid aside. Well, we would pray for them this morning. We think of that uh, word of the psalmist, Lord, perhaps uh, looking on a little quaint, but no doubt full of great meaning, of how the Lord maketh our bed in our sickness. And we pray that that will be the case for those that are sick today. Remember those that are infirm because of age. Those, Lord, maybe of our burdens pressing upon them. Perhaps some that have been bereaved in recent days. The cruel hand of death has struck. And today, Lord, the heart is heavy. There's a tear, Lord, not far away in the eye. Well, oh God, we would pray for such a one today that they might know that comfort of God. For we thank thee, Father, that thee are the God of all comfort, the God who can stretch forth the hand. The God, Lord, who one day will wipe away all tears from our eyes. Well, we pray this morning, help us, Lord, to weep with those that weep. So often, Lord, we find it easier and uh, more enjoyable by the very nature to rejoice with those who rejoice. Join in the laughter and the time of merriment. But, Lord, may we ever have that compassionate heart for those, Lord, who carry burdens. And help us to carry their burdens too. And help them as best we can. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Remember our province at this time. Our country as a whole. Lord, we are in dark days. We acknowledge that this morning. The wicked are, are in authority. Uh, and Lord, therefore, Lord, the people mourn. Oh, we pray for days when the righteous would be an authority and there would be a rejoicing among the people, a holy joy. And we pray, Father, that you'll deal with all the enemies of the gospel, all these wicked movements that have risen up, Lord, in these last days in defiance of God. Lord, we pray that you may blow upon them this morning 
We pray that you'll stop them in their tracks and show thyself strong on behalf of those who fear thy name. <coughs> we must acknowledge, Lord, that thou hast been gracious to us. You've answered prayer. We want to acknowledge that this morning. We say, Great is thy faithfulness, that the Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Hear and answer prayer this morning, and continue with us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we turn for our reading this morning, please? I want us to turn to Second Thessalonians and the chapter 3. Second Thessalonians and the chapter 3. And we're going to read the whole of the chapter together. Second Thessalonians and the chapter 3. We're going to read from the verse 1 down to the verse 18, which is the end of the chapter and of the epistle. Which is why, of course, we have these words, Finally, brethren, and he was one of those rare preachers when he said finally, he meant it. I've heard a lot of finallys in the one sermon. Sometimes, I hope I don't do it today. <laughs> I feel I'm setting myself up here uh, and hang myself, as it were. But the word of the Lord. Finally, brethren, pray for us. The word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you. That ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. And into the patient waiting for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labour and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are uh, some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always, by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle. So I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen indeed. May the Lord bless the public uh, reading of his word. We're going to ask our brother Jackie. Alistair, come now, please, brother, and bring the announcements. Good morning, everyone. Again, it's good to see you out uh, in the house of God this morning. Uh, we do welcome you uh, in the Saviour's name, and we do pray that the Lord will bless each one. If you happen to be a visitor in our meeting this morning, 
uh, then you're particularly welcome, and we do pray that you'll feel at home amongst us here in this congregation in Cumber. A special word of welcome to our brother, Mr. Colin Maxwell. Uh, as he has mentioned, uh, he's one of those who we've long regarded uh, as a friend of the congregation here, and it is good to have him back with us and to renew fellowship with him uh, in the Word of God today. Do remember uh, this afternoon at 3 p.m. Uh, there is the open air uh, meeting. Uh, many of us leaving about a quarter to three, those who go down the minibus uh, here. Uh, and the venue this afternoon is Castle Lane, down at the bottom end there, uh, just at the junction with Castle Street. Uh, so that will be where we meet this afternoon uh, for the open air meeting. Uh, then, of course, again in the evening time, 7 p.m., our gospel service, our brother Colin will be back with us uh, for that meeting. You remember, of course, over in the church hall, uh, there is a season of prayer for half an hour uh, before that service. Uh, over the holiday months, just the two meetings during the week, uh, our prayer meeting Tuesday evening at 8 p.m. goes ahead as usual, uh, and our brother, Mr. Colin McKee, will be speaking at the, open, at the uh, prayer meeting on Tuesday evening. Uh, then on Friday at 10 p.m., uh, there is our men's prayer meeting as usual. Next Lord's Day, the service is at the usual times, half past 11 and 7 p.m., and our brother, Mr. Noel Shields, who will be the speaker uh, next Lord's Day, God willing. Uh, and of course, in the afternoon as well, uh, go, uh, the weather permitting, uh, there will be our open air meeting. Uh, it will be the second Lord's Day of the month, and as you know, uh, that's when we take up our monthly missionary offering. Uh, so that will be taken up after the services next Lord's Day. And this month, that offering goes to the Missionary Council uh, of our denomination. Then can I just remind you uh, of the Holiday Bible Club that's coming up shortly, not this incoming week, uh, but the following week from Monday the 15th uh, through to Friday the 19th of August. Uh, no doubt those involved are well aware of that. Uh, but do, everyone, just remember that in prayer. Uh, the little short holiday Bible club that we had earlier on was very well attended. Uh, we hope that that will be the case again and that good numbers of boys and girls will be gathered in uh, night by night. And of course, of course that will cul culminate uh, then in the prize giving and the night when we invite parents and friends along uh, on the following Sunday evening. That's Sunday the 21st of August uh, at the evening service. And our brother Robert will be along and responsible for that service. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for bringing the announcements and also the warm words of welcome. And it is good to be back with you again here in Cumber. I was here not so long ago, just maybe about five, six weeks ago for a deputation meeting and we enjoyed the fellowship that night and also the generosity of the Lord's people. So it's good to be back again on the Lord's Day and have the, the pleasure as well as the responsibility of bringing the word of the Lord. We are going to sing his praises again, 371. Uh, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the pleasures of sin I resign, my gracious Redeemer, my Saviour art thou, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. 371. Remain seated for the first part of the hymn, and uh, let's sing out with all our hearts, unto the Lord, 371.
Let's stand for verse 4, please, in Mansions of Glory. Standing, please. Let's turn again, please, to the word of the Lord. We read together. We read in Second Thessalonians chapter 3. And we read the verse 1 down to the verse 18, the last chapter of the epistle. We want to look this morning at a text of Scripture. We'll put it into context in the introduction. But look at the words of verse 5. The words of the apostle this church, people just like ourselves, different needs, different backgrounds perhaps, but the same salvation, the redeemed of God, and his prayer for them is this, the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. And with the, the Bible open before us this morning, again, just for a moment, that's, that's still our hearts. Heavenly Father, the hour has come now for the preaching of the Word of God. We set great store by preaching. For we remember it was the words of the same apostle who wrote our text, also wrote by inspiration. The young Timothy preached the Word and be instant in season and out of season. And I need thy help, Lord, to do that. The arm of flesh will surely fail, and we dare not trust our own. But we turn our eyes again towards the hills from whence doth come our aid. And we pray, our power, that the power of the Spirit of God may rest upon the preacher, I and the hearer alike. Give us an ear to hear, Lord, what you're saying to us, and a heart to obey. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. This chapter 3 of uh, 2 Thessalonians opens with the Apostle Paul initially requesting prayer for himself, or to be more precise, for his ministry of the Word of God. He desires that the Word of God whether it be in preaching form, when he would go into pulpits or into the open air, or whether it be in a written form, like this epistle, whatever way the Word of God would be sounded out, that the Word would meet with no hindrances, but run freely and be glorified. And then in verse 2, as we move on a little bit, he requests prayer for himself and for his companions in labor. For you'll notice there how he uses the plural, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and from wicked men, from unreasonable people who don't have logic on their side, wicked unbelievers, for it says all men have not faith. And the Thessalonians, of course, uh, they, they knew all about such men. Because when the church started in Thessalonica, in days of revival, they were also days of riot. You can read the account over in Acts chapter 17, the first 10 verses. That's where Paul uses that somewhat quaint uh, phrase almost where he referred to certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. We would just call them thugs, wouldn't we? They were bullies. They were thugs who were hired to break up and to destroy the work of God. And that's why back in the first epistle, in the chapter 2, and uh, the 
uh, verse 2, he was able to speak about preaching the gospel with much contention. And it's not always easy to preach the gospel. There's some places you go in and there's a lot of boys not very happy and they're not just content to shout at you. Maybe they'll throw something at you and seek to drive you away. So the Thessalonians knew all about that. In verse 3, Paul turns his attention away, then having mentioned it, put it on the prayer list, for he turns his attention away from his own safety and he turns to the ministry, to the, the Thessalonians themselves. And you notice there how he expresses his supreme confidence. First of all, there in verse 3, that God would establish them and keep them from evil. And then in verse 4, his confidence is expressed that the Thessalonians, to whom he is writing, would be faithful Christians serving this faithful God who, who's going to protect them, keep them safe. And uh, they would serve him by uh, actually obeying the apostles' commands. This leads us up now nicely to our text then, where he says, And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. You see, this confidence uh, in verse 4 is not built on human endeavor, although it is exhorted rightly and implied, but it's rooted in the divine activity, in the work of God. And what we have here in our text in verse 5 is a de facto prayer. It's not the words of a prayer directed to God as such, not directly directed to God, if I can put it like that, but still there's a strong reliance here on the Lord. The Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. Now I must be honest this morning and tell you, before we examine our text, that there is some disagreement, as there invariably is, among the commentators uh, regarding and referencing here this love of God. If you go to the, the commentators, and we're thinking of Matthew Henry this morning, and, and Poole and Kelvin, the, the standard ones, then you will find that they disagree among themselves. Is it the love of God to us? We are thinking about here. The Galatians 2.20 type scenario. The Son of God loved me, and he gave himself for me. As we have it in our hymn book, the love that Jesus had for me to suffer on the cruel tree? Or is it a reference to our love to him? And we think of the words that we'll reference later on where the Lord said to Peter, Peter, lovest thou me? I must admit that my, my inclination would be to look at it in the latter. I thought about the text a little bit, came to mind, and preachers, usually when texts come to mind, they get a little envelope somewhere and scratch down a few thoughts, a little outline. And it was only when I went to the commentators that I discovered that there were those who took it just a little different. So I'm only giving you here this morning. By the way, some of the commentators give you both, and uh, I think that's always a clever thing to do because then you can milk the same cow twice, as it were, take it different ways. But this morning we're going to look at it in the latter way. We're thinking this morning about our love for God. Our love for God. The first thing that we might think about here, number one, is this, that God is to be loved. God is to be loved. We know that sinful man, the unsaved man, the ungodly man, the unreasonable, the wicked man, as we have it there, is naturally left to himself without any influence. He would be naturally what the Bible calls in Romans 1 and 30, a hater of God, barely tolerant, only tolerant because there are laws to stop him expressing physical hatred against the people of God. He is naturally a hater of God. Some hate him so much 
as to actually deny his very existence. The fools answering here to that word unreasonable. The fools who say in their heart, in the very bottom of their being, that there is no God. And no one has any reason to hate God. Because from what we know of God, as he is revealed in his word, that he is the supremely good being. There's nobody better. There's nobody more good than God. It was to Job's credit, Job was one of the great heroes of the word of God, that even in the day of the greatest calamity, in the day when his business that he had worked so hard to build up collapsed round about him, in the day when his family, his nearest and dearest, his children, his offspring, were taken from him, all in one day, it says that in that day of calamity, which would have been therefore a day of temptation like he had never seen before, it says, and all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. That's a great chapter where he said, The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. And anything that would detract from the glory of God is to be put far from us because God is supremely good. And God himself, as revealed in the scripture, is the very epitome of love. Twice in 1 John chapter 4, we have this very short definition. God is love. God is love. I know that the world talks much about love. There was that great love revolution back in the 1960s. Now and again on the radio on comes all those old songs that many of us can remember. All songs about love. But it's an impure love. It's largely a song not so much about love. It's a song about lust. It's a song, perhaps now, in more recent days, about unnatural, deviant practices, sinful and wicked. But God himself is the very epitome of the true love. When you have opportunity, you read about all the attributes of this love. In 1 Corinthians 13, love is kind, it is long-suffering. Well, there you have as it were, a drawing, a word form of God. You can see that God is love. And we can go a little further here this morning, and we can say that we believe that God loves all men without exception. He loves all men without exception, it is true. And uh, we must put this in, of course, that he loves some, and that is an innumerable multitude that no man can number, he loves them with an electing love. If you go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4, it says there, Knowing, brethren, beloved, a loved of God, knowing your election of God. Again, in the chapter 2 there of the second epistle, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, Beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. And this is a great doctrine in its own right. It's tied to the purposes of God, his eternal purposes, whereby he purposed in himself to love people on the salvation. But never let us forget this morning that he also loves all men without exception, with a tender and a merciful love. That's Psalm 145 and verse 9. And every breath that we breathe, with every morsel of food, every material pleasure and provision that we uh, enjoy has come to us direct from the bountiful hand of a loving God. That's why it's good, you know, when we give or when we, we sit down to our food just to bow our heads. A very simple act, isn't it? But just bow your head and thank God for the food that he has supplied because it comes from the hand 
of God. We see this distinctly in the life of the Lord Jesus. It says he went about doing good. The supreme God manifest in the flesh. The greatest evidence of God's love, of course, was when the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. To save us from the guilt of our sins. Isn't that a tremendous thing? When you put your head on the pillow at night, you can look back with, well, with all your failures, maybe you, your conscience maybe at you just a little bit. You realize maybe you were out of turn. You said things you ought not to have said. You did things you ought not to have done. Maybe thought things you ought not to have thought. But you can put your head on the pillow at night as a child of God. And you can say, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And you can only say that because the Bible says God commanded his love towards us, set it forth, demonstrated it, and that Christ, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And therefore, God is to be loved in return. We love him, said the Apostle John, because he first loved us. So God is to be loved. That's very basic. Number two, uh, we can say this. We should love God with all of our hearts. With all of our hearts. Paul makes reference to the things that the apostles had commanded. Look at verse 4. We have confidence in the Lord touching you that you will both do, that you both do and will do. You're doing it now and it's your plan for the future. The things that we commanded you. Now these weren't human commands. Just as those traditions there in verse 6 were not human traditions. Paul did not lord it over the consciences of men. Uh, anybody starts to lord it over your conscience, you need to be aware of that person. Uh, sometimes you can have churches and they could be orthodox in their doctrine and evangelical and so on, but they could be very cultish where there's a large, unreasonable measure of uh, control being exercised. That ought not to be. But there are commands from God. Commands that have come from him. And they were received, as far as the apostles are concerned, by revelation of God. As you know, when we break bread, often the formula that is read out from 1 Corinthians verse 11 is this. I have delivered unto you that which I have received from the Lord. And that was revelation given to the apostle. So these commands have the same idea. Well, from ancient times, we have had this first and greatest commandment, that we love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. That's how our Lord described it, the first and the greatest commandment. And we know when there is but a half-hearted love for God, well, then it's not really love at all because God speaks to us this morning. He's speaking. Yes, we've taken these words sometimes in the gospel, but primarily it's spoken to the child of God. My son, one already in the family, one who has received Christ, for it's to them he gives the, the power the authority to become the sons of God. My son, God is saying to us this morning, he says, give me thine heart. That's a big ask, isn't it, really? If he just said, give me your money, well, we could dig into the pocket and give a few bob, couldn't we? We could afford to do that still. He says, give me an hour of your time. Well, what's an hour of time? We could give that as well, maybe a couple of hours. But no, as God, he can demand, and he, can, and he wants it all. My son, give me thine heart. No creature can demand that. And where it is given to a creature, it's idolatry. 
It's having another God before him. The breaking off the first commandment. We're on a whole different level here, you see. God says that he is a jealous God. In fact, it's one of his names. His name is Jealous. Maybe you say, well, that doesn't sound right because on our level, jealousy is something that is impure. If you're jealous of somebody, maybe of what they have, and you don't have it, maybe their skills, well, that's something that is impure. We would actively discourage that, confess that as a sin unto God, get alone with God and say, Lord, I'm struggling here. Well, this jealousy, somebody has something and I want it. I'm, I'm jealous of that because jealousy shows discontentment with what the holy and wise providence of God has given to us. Jealousy is a work of the flesh and it is a sin. But when God is jealous, it's not a sinful jealousy. And he is jealous as he must be with his own glory. He will not share it with another because to do so would encourage sin. And God this morning is doing you a great favor by commanding that you love him with all your heart. It's the road to blessing this morning. He says, I will love them. I will love them who love me. But he's not interested this morning in what we might call a fractional love. A sad scene confronts us in the Old Testament, written, of course, for our uh, edification for our learning and our edification concerning Solomon. What love God poured out onto that man, Solomon. What wisdom he gave him. His name means peace, doesn't it? Or words along that line. What a, what a heritage that, that man had. His father was David, the great psalmist. The man after God's own heart. It says of Solomon that he loved many strange women. The word stranger means foreign. Not that they were oddballs. doesn't mean strange in that sense, but they were foreign women. We would say, where was the marriage ban now? Where were the vows that he made? We would have to say in the beginning it was not so, was it? It was one man for one woman in the beginning. But here's one who loved many strange or foreign women. And as it was predicted and warned these foreign, these strange women turned away his heart. They brought in those from the Sidonians, those from the Ammonites. And yes, he would still say that he loved Jehovah, loved the Lord. He would have read the word such as it existed at that time. But the Bible says he went after Ishtaroth, the false empty God of the Sidonians, Malcolm, the God of the Ammonites. The phrase went after is interesting. The word that they use there is used positively of Rebekah. You remember that lovely story, that early love story in the Bible where she is asked, great gospel text, wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. The question is, do you love this man's master, who was Isaac, enough to go with this man, to meet the man you're going to marry? And she said, of course, I will go. But even more specific, the same word that he went after is translated as love. In Jeremiah 2 and 25, and again in Jeremiah 8 and 2, and it's in relation to unfaithful Israel giving her love to another and not to God. A whole church, the Ephesian church, was rebuked in Revelation chapter 2. The church at Ephesus, you know, was really a strong church. You only need to read the, what I call, because there's this second epistle to Ephesus, the Ephesians in Revelation. But in the first epistle to the Ephesians, very doctrinal, isn't it? A good church, good church, held the line, doctrinally sound. But in Revelation chapter 2, they were rebuked for leaving their first love. It had cooled and diminished. 
It was something else that had stole away the heart. The words of Christ already quoted this morning to Peter. Peter, do you love, do you love me? These are tender words this morning. Peter had denied the Lord as we know. Wept bitterly. I'm sure there was many a bitter tear even after that. Beating himself up over his denial. How could I be, have been so foolish, so outspoken, so loud? I have said I would never deny him. And a little girl, the weakest of all Satan's instruments, caused me to fall. He must have beaten himself up. Oh, the words are here, lovest thou me, to woo him back to future service. Peter has said, I go a fishing. But no, the Lord said, Peter, you're going to preaching instead. And just as he had called him initially into the service of God, when Peter had gone a fishing, he was mending his nets, if you remember rightly. Well, he was called to go back again and get back into the work of God. What a word for the backsider this morning. The cold of heart, there's still room for you in the plan of God. We see here thirdly, and we're moving on quickly, looking at our text here, verse 5. We see from this that we need the Lord to direct our hearts to love him. You see, in your regeneration, not that wonderful, wonderful moment when you were born of God, Brought into the family of God. Saved by grace. Face the word now toward heaven and home. God gave you a heart. A heart capable of loving him. And he took away that old heart. All things were made new. That old heart, deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can plunge its depths? He says, I'll take away that old heart of stone. A hard heart. And he gave you a new heart. A heart capable of loving him. And yet, as seen with Solomon, we can often display that divided heart. And if we were left to ourselves, that divided heart would manifest itself every single day. You see, we might go along to some great Bible conferences and be really, really blessed. Maybe a week of meeting, the preacher coming in and Powerful night after night. It seems heaven is drawing very, very near. And there's a little reviving and among the people of God. There's a cheeriness again. There's a lifting up of ourselves out, out of the rut. Out, out of the humdrum of everyday life. There's an inch to our step. We're looking at our watch during the day. I'll soon be at the house of God. And you really feel in your heart of hearts that, that you do love God. And that you will do so with that same intensity every single day. Oh, I don't want to burst your happy bubbles this morning if you're like that. But will you? Will you? Yeah, let's face reality. Let's face it now that there's a preacher in the pulpit. Let's try and get a softer landing. You see, sometimes we might have grounds in our experience to query whether we ever love him at all. I'm sure you've been there. The hymn writer, Mr. Bonner, wrote the words. He said, My love is oft times low, and my joy still ebbs and flows. And here's the reality this morning. For most of us, 99.9% of us, we can't sustain these high moments in our Christian experiences. That's what, I think that's what makes them so great, you know. That... Maybe we don't get them all that often. But we do enjoy them while we have them. Well, Paul's desire here, which is a prayer, is a reality, I think, to be experienced. That the Lord would direct our hearts into the love of God. This ought to be the norm among God's people. There are two kindred verses to this. Over in Philippians chapter 2, in verses 12 and 13, the Bible exhorts us there. Again, you see, you have the commandment there, the exhortation. What is expected of us as believers? We are exhorted to work out our own salvation. Not work for it, because you can never do that. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But no, to work it out. 
to what's it within, to work it out, to, to, to manifest it so that others will see it. And we are to do it with fear and trembling. That's a big ask. And again, we might feel a little overwhelmed. How can little me rise to this great task? But Paul comes to the rescue again. And he says, for or because it is God. God who wants us to work out our salvation. It is God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's a work of God within us. And even more specific, over in Romans 5 and verse 5, coming near our text, the Bible says the love of God. And in this case, I think it's his love towards us. The objective, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It's a divine work. Let me use a gardening illustration. Not really a gardener, I just cut the grass. But nevertheless, I, I see the wife planting the flowers. Plants a, a lovely rose in the garden. Come back from the, the garden centre and there's the rose for the garden. And she puts it into the, in among the flowers. And we're expecting, of course, a beautiful bloom. If it goes into the vase, you may get a wee bit of a bloom, but you know it's going to be thrown out, but it's going into the garden. And the expectation is that year after year there's going to be a bloom. Now in order to get this beautiful bloom and get the value for the money that was spent in the glory of the garden, it has to be seen to that the rose is well cared for. No use having weeds in your garden and planting roses. Weeds, weeds are desperate things. We all know that. No use planting it among the thorns. It'll rise up and choke it. It needs to be well watered, particularly in the heat of summer. With the drought coming in, the ground starting to get parts, well, the old rose isn't going to do too good, is it? It needs to be watered. It needs to be lovingly looked after. And that's what God is doing for us by the Spirit of the Lord. To change the imagery just a little bit over in Ephesians 2 verse 10, it tells us that we are God's workmanship created on the good works. The word there for workmanship is the same word from which we get our word poems. And God is a great poet. And your heart, with which you must love him, with it all. Your heart is that page on which God writes beautiful poetry in our lives. And he directs our hearts to love him, and yet he does it in a way. We're not going to look for the joy in this morning, but he does it in such a way whereby it is actually and freely our love towards him. And we know that he uses the various means of grace to do so, the reading and the meditating upon his word. That man who walked not in the counsel of the ungodly, and so on, got away from the weeds, if we might put it like that. His delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law doth he meditate day and night, like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither. Again, fervent prayer, both Uh, privately, in the closet, and corporately, in the prayer meeting, in the fellowship of the saints. It's how important it is that we can come together. You know, when we had the lockdown uh, not that long ago, of course, we weren't able to meet together. And we were all sitting around our iPads and our computers, weren't we? And we were watching in. And it served a purpose. I've likened it on to when you have crutches and a broken leg. Great old help to get around. But you know when the, when, when the legs healed and it takes the weight again, we can put away the crutches. And maybe it's convenient just to watch in. But you know if we can be in the house of God this morning, it's where we ought to be in fellowship with the saints. It's part of the means that God uses. In the ordinances, the baptism, the Lord's Supper, 
the Lord would have us direct our, direct our hearts into his love. And then fourthly and lastly, and very quickly here this morning, such love, as we read in our text, will enable us to wait patiently for Christ. Again, commentators, different interpretations. Some think this morning that it means to display the patience of Christ in our hearts. If so, what an example then he was towards us. How patiently he bore the contradiction of sinners against himself. Or it might be, follow Mr. Calvin in this one, that the love of God will help us to wait patiently until what Calvin calls our ultimate redemption. And that's when the Lord Jesus comes again. The sky, not the grave, this morning is our goal. We're waiting for him to come again. Part of those prayers that we should be breathing out as God directs our love towards him is this, even so come Lord Jesus. And we're waiting for him to come again. A little note in the Geneva Bible refers to it as a watchful mind to the coming of Christ. I notice when these commentators, whilst there might be different interpretations, they all sound good one way or the other. You know, we can't lose whatever way we take it. And it's exciting. And Paul wants us to be partakers of it. Again, this should be the norm among God's people. What's happening in your life? You should be able to say, the Lord's directing my heart and the love towards him. And we should pray one for another. That the Lord would direct all our hearts into that love towards our Savior. It's our chief end this morning, and it ought to be our chief joy to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. May the Lord bless these words this morning to all of our hearts. 335 is our closing hymn, 335, Jesus keep me near the cross, for there a precious fountain, free to all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mount. And let's, let's sing it out this morning with all our hearts, 335.
may we take the strains of this home with us, Lord, today. Help us to remember the Sabbath day today and to keep it holy. Bless, Lord, in the open air in the, the afternoon. May the people in that part of the town know the day of their visitation, the wise, and consider their latter end. And bring us back again, Lord, to the house of God, afresh even tonight. And again, Lord, direct our hearts into the love of God. For Father, that is our reasonable service. Thank you for your help today, for the blessing just that been here. And be with us now, your blessing that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow, with it resting upon our heads. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>